I've got the countdown here. Whoa, we nearly got two intros there. Good evening, everybody. I hope this finds you absolutely superb. Oh, we nearly got two intros oh. there. Good evening, Spud, everybody. can you turn the volume down on your device, mate? Yeah, I'm doing it now. Yeah, it's for some reason. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Well, so, I just knocked it off. Yeah. Start again. Uh, yes. I'm Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marine, host of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. How about that for a bit of merchandise uh, promotion? Um, we had an absolutely brilliant premiere this week. And before I say anything more, check this out. Because at the time, girls and boys were still coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, fucked up in all sorts of, oh, it's awful, awful. These wars, these unjust and illegal wars, it, it grips me, Chris, it really does, it grips me. And the first month of SES selection is, is just pure physical. The Royal Marines had to leave the Navy, join the Army, and when you join the Army, they had to have a parent... Uh, regiment to belong to and of course that regiment was the parachute regiment mm. and if they failed selection in theory they would they would get posted back to the parachute regiment can you imagine a royal marine in the parachute regiment Spud, is there something about oh, being in the regiment that get... makes people stay around Hereford for their... Let's get that audio off. So, friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the live chat Nigel Spud Ely, former parachute regiment, former um, special air service, uh, Falklands veteran, I could go on and on, but we're, we're going to obviously be talking for the next hour. So, Spud, absolutely brilliant to see you again, mate. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for for the invite, Chris. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I'll be honest. I I was quite uh, touched, I suppose you could say, by the feedback we had from our podcast, mate. It was absolutely unbelievable. Um mm. Just so many comments. Well, actually, there were so many saying it was it was the best podcast they've seen. So certainly on my wow. cha my wow. channel. So um, <laughs> there you go. Do wow, you that's incredible. Well, thanks everyone that uh, put a comment up, good or bad. Yeah, no, they were all good. There were there were no uh, absolutely no bad ones at all. Which um, I can't say that for all my guests. <laughs> <But>, <laughs> It's uh, that's yeah. that's the nature of YouTube. But um, has anyone got in touch with you to say that they watched it? Um, I've had a uh, I've had a few uh, emails. They've obviously got through um, my website uh, asking questions about the film, um, kind of saying that they really enjoyed it and they wanted they wanted more of the sort of goose screen. Um, and I sort of have to say to them that you know I've got a book coming out next year. And the film is going into pre-production end of this summer, so it should have been should have been in post-production now, but we've had COVID, so um, so I've had to sort of keep a lot of things under wraps. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's really humbling to know that uh, people are interested in the subject. Um, 
you know, I mean, I'm, I'm really, really pleased. Yes. Well, you speak very well, mate, which made, made my job easy. And it's actually, <laughs> it's actually funny with the podcasting. Um, I do different kinds, Spud, you know. So yeah. if I'm talking to a mate that I, that I know that we maybe chat on the internet, you know, a couple of times a week or whatever, especially in the current climate. And let's not let's not say any buzzwords, but everyone knows what I'm on about. Um, there's certainly certain people are more enlightened as to what's going on than others. Mm. And if I'm chatting with one of those guys, like I did Mike McCarthy the other day, I'll talk a lot because it's it's a chat between mates, right? It, it's sure. It's um, sometimes you have to chat or chip in. When the guest is mm. kind of going off, <laughs> they're, they're kind of veering <laughs> off the topic or they're, they're saying it in a way that we're just going to lose lo lo loads yeah. of people. They won't follow what we're saying. But when mm. we, we chatted, I was just, it was a delight to just sit back and, and listen to your story. Well, you just let me waffle on, didn't you? I mean, I couldn't believe that uh, you were hardly going to edit it. That sort of scared me a bit. But uh, it was about a, an hour and a half or something like that. Um, so I can't believe you didn't edit it, uh, but there you go. That's uh, um, no, a, a that's what it is. A, you like to, you like it raw, so th that's great. And your audience, obviously, and your subscribers like it raw too. So um, well, that's the, probably the way to go then t this evening. Yeah, um, I don't generally edit the podcast, but it's it's only if <laughs> there's a technical issue and i think we had one or two during ours with my my zoom mm. going down yeah. um yeah um but no i like they call it i think they call it long form which is just a chat and it and it starts here and it ends there um yeah if, if maybe i don't know let's just say you sometimes i'm i'm too much effing and blinding <laughs> i might i might edit some of the, those out just, yeah yeah just, just yeah, to sure. not, not upset too many people. Mm. But it's it's like I say, these stories need to be, um, they need to be down for the record. You know, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I've spent the last two years uh, traveling around the UK, interviewing um, for, for, my, for my latest book, Goose Green Uncensored Voices. And it's not just about, the guys in goose green two para it revolves around everybody civilians as well around two para and it's not the blood and gut story it's the stories behind the scenes that that that, that emotional side um where the guys are loading up the ammunition for example way back at sort of uh b echelon and um they're hearing about their mates getting killed or injured i mean it's uh it's about the the crew of the norland the mv norland which is the ship two para or well, the vessel, I should say. Is that right? Vessel, yeah, <laughs> in marine talk, um, that we sail down on. Uh, I've interviewed a load of those. And it's, I've, I've made the choice of not interviewing anybody above the rank of captain, apart from Chris Keeble, who was the chap that took over from Jones, and he's a major. So I kind of, I think that gives it the grittiness, the rawness. And I've tried to keep the, the tales and the vignettes in the vernacular. I've tried to, rather than sort of, make it nice and smooth it's it is pretty raw it's pretty raw interviewing and um i out of over a hundred stories and tales i've got i've interviewed 86 guys um face to face three have had written testimonials sent in but i've spoke to them over the phone and spoke to them at face to face about them um and there's only three or four, which I haven't actually seen the people, but they've sent me in their testimonial or their little story, purely because they live the other side of the world. And, um, yeah, so I think that's – it's going to be a type of book where you'd be able to pick it up and put it down pretty quick because they're very short stories, 50, 50 words. I think the longest is, is about 750, which for anybody that doesn't know, that's probably about two and a half pages of a normal book. But generally they're about 50. And I've kept them in chronological order so the reader will know where he or she is if they have to stop for whatever reason. I mean, it's not, it's not in long, long chapters either, but it's, a, but it's a big book. I'm hoping it's going to be about 150 pages, 
which is qu quite a monster, really. What's the What's the title going to be, mate? Goose Green, Uncensored Voices. Okay, and do you have yeah. a Do you have any idea of a rough release date? Well, the fortieth anniversary. My God, twenty eighth of May next year. So publishers will probably get it get it together about April, I suppose. I mean, they're doing the jacket now. Um, is it so, um, is it voices of the paras that fought at Goose Green, or or, or is it is is there Argentine voices, or, or how does that work? No, no, it's um, it's it's anybody. For example, I had a, a farmer friend of mine when he was a he was at college. Uh, he's given me a little story when he heard about Goose Green. It's purely about Goose Green. Um, I've, as I say, I've got the crew. It's um, yeah, it's it's not it's, we're not having any Argentines there. I, I mean, I I want to keep it within, you know, I want a British. I, I mean, there's a lot of veterans that's still on over it, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, I remember my uncle back in the 70s. I mean, he was a prisoner of war, Japanese, and he would never buy anything Japanese. And that's when the motorbikes and the cars started to come over in the early 70s. And he was just, I remember him even now, he was just so angry. Um, so you're talking the same sort of period. There's a lot of veterans that um, want, they want to do this sort of reconciliation business with the Argies, and that's fine. And that's really good as well. Um, but for me, and for a lot of the guys, especially within the powers, I, I don't think, uh, well, mind you, I can't talk to all of them kind of for everybody, but certainly for me. But I will say in the last World Cup in 2019, I did support Argentina over France. So, you know, so I don't, my grievances are slightly probably displaced. But uh, yeah, I supported the Argies over the French. I watched one of those um, brilliant, Diego Maradona documentaries the other day. I, I can't remember off my head if it's the latest one or the one before, but um, it was when he was playing in, in Italy. And he becomes such a legend there, absolutely loved and mm. adored. And, and when the World Cup came around, he had to play for Argentina. Was it, was it against Italy in the actual stadium that he bloody played in, and it it just, <laughs> it's, mm. um, yeah, the, the, it, it's very strange. Something like that, which to a rational person would be, well, the guy's got to play for his country, isn't he? You know, you got to play football yeah. for your country. That that, that it's a, <laughs> it's an honour. It's an amazing chance. And um, God, he got absolutely just hated for it. He was public. Did he? Yeah, yeah, public enemy number mm. one. I'm just. I mean, I, when was the hand of God? Was that in the '83? Was on '83 World Cup? I do recall something, or a bit, probably a bit later. Yeah. He always said that was for the Malvinas, you know, that hand of God. Um, but uh, I, I look. I, I mean, I've been to the islands. I've returned, and I've interviewed the. Um, I've interviewed people. There were 119 hostages held in the in the community centre at Goose Green. I mean, they were held in absolutely squalid conditions for three weeks. I mean, absolutely terrible. One lad, Denzel, was pulled out and actually beaten to shit. I mean, it's absolutely disgraceful. And there was a baby there of, of a few months old as well. Um, so that side of it was, the sort of officer side of it was awful. They, they shouldn't have done that. And, uh, how, but, you know. So, sorry, how did that know. come, how did that come around, Spud? Who, what, the, who, what? Who, who was Denzel? Uh, Denzel is a uh, Fulton Islander, and um, because they were pushed into the community centre, 119 of them, for Christ's sakes, and it's, it's not a big community centre, um, he had to go out and get some uh, nappies uh, for, for the baby and get some food and stuff. And what happened was there was, uh, he went to a house, that, there was a radio ham that had a radio there, one of these... Uh, um, what do they call them? You know, like uh, a radio ham. Yeah, radio enthusiasts for our, for our younger yeah. people. So he had one of these radios there, and uh, the RG that was with him, obviously he had he had a prisoner escort, and um, just happened to see this radio, and then then it all kicked off from there. They thought he was going to use the radio, so they beat shit out of him. 
and, he, and I, when I when I interviewed Denzel, bless him, um, you know, he was really shaking and s still suffers from it. But equally, the, some of the the, um, the the goose green settlers down there in, um, that were captured, one lady said to me, and I, you know, she said they were absolutely worse than Nazis, and they hate them. There is such a hatred for them. It's 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 you know, it's quite obvious. It is. Yeah, it's a funny thing, mate, isn't it? I, I've seen some of the videos where, for example, when the pilot get ends up in the drink and the landing craft guy goes and rescues him, or or maybe it's the guy that shot him down or whatever. But they they meet up in in later life you know obviously we're talking mm. 20 30 years probably 20 years after sure. the event and they become yeah. they become um i don't know what you call it but bond, bonded by war and then to yeah. the, to the mm. other side of the coin when i um chatted with major andy shaw royal marines who had a massive battle with with PTSD after his Falklands experience. He was involved mm. in a in a blue on blue, um, and I think four four chaps oh. mm. four chaps were shot dead, um, mm. and a few injured under under his fire orders. Right to to initiate this ambush. He's an absolutely wonderful wonderful guy. Really lovely yeah. man, but. At one point during our podcast, when the subject of the uh, Argentine's conduct came up, his face just went just went like lead. Um, Sorry, when, when he's con when he's when he's what do you mean when his conduct came up? Um, when, when we were discussing the Argentine's conduct. On, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the on the Falklands. Yeah. About your about the chap that was in the LSL that rescued the pilot. Yeah, not that. Yeah. Um, what I'm sorry, Spar. I'll start again. Sometimes you meet these these guys that have have been on the opposite sides in war, and they come together yeah. and they form a friendship. And and I think you know, I, I'm a great believer that humanity loves each other. Mm. We're not we're not out for these mm. bloody bloody wars. You know, no. it, it, it's just bad management. Um, and it's great when you see people that can come and have a hug and shake hands and, and, it, and it's all, it's just bloody history, right? Mm -hmm. But when, yeah. I was, when I was talking to Andy, I did mention something about um, the Argentines down there and my God, his face just went black. Yeah. And he just looked mm. at the camera and went, fucking animals, right? <laughs> mm. And as a podcast host, that's the bit where you just yeah, yeah. shut up and sit back yeah. and, and, and well, let... they, uh, yeah. I mean, there is a hatred down there, and I, I, I'm sure the Falkland Islanders don't mind me saying that because I've experienced it. They've actually told me, so I'm not saying that they're all like that, but uh, um, they don't like the Argies coming over to pay respects to the graves um, because they didn't mind it initially. But from what I understand, is that the families would come over. And there would be some sort of other type of people, probably political people, come over, and they would hide the Argentine flag somewhere, mm. you know, and they, they, they would hide hide all bits of things around the island, um, their Malvinas, you know, to to, to to actually still have a have a grasp on the island. So, um, they, you know, the the Falkland Islanders didn't take too kindly to that. So that that didn't help with uh, them getting together. What what a lot of people don't realise is um, when the uh, cemetery there's a cemetery at Goose Green on quite a nice it's quite a nice it's it's in a high place where the, the War Graves Commission British War Graves Commission um, buried the Argies the dead Argentines and were exhumed at, at the cost of the British taxpayer and flown back to Argentina. Um, and people don't understand that it was it was the British taxpayer that paid for that on the request of the, the Argentine government, and mm. you know they still they still scream Malvinas, and I think that's what irritates the Falkland Islanders, and it certainly irritates a lot of the vets I know as well, because honestly, it's a beautiful place down there. It's stunning, it's unbelievable, and the people are are, are really nice too. They're so welcoming, and you know. Um, 
it is it is it is it is a special place spud on the subject of graves um what i've done while we've been talking i've i've just i've had a um i've been looking at a goose green video in the background so people can see okay. some 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 pi some pictures um i'm just going to get it up now it's god this that's, oh, john, that's the john that's john not isn't it the defense secretary i um, think can you are you looking at your second oh. screen second screen now yeah 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 it, it I'm might, looking down at it there might be a bit of oh. a bit of a delay yeah that's goose green yeah yeah i'm, wow. look, I'm looking at the mask uh, I, I haven't seen them before yeah i'm looking at the mask grave um see i've got that story there i know the two guys there that's us burying our dead in the makeshift grave can you tell us about what what what's that that it just must must be so mm. emotion, um, emotional well, that but... was uh you got to um obviously when uh you know when you get killed the body goes it starts uh you know um degrading pretty quick but it, it was cold out there and um so they so the rsm mal simpson who i've interviewed on this uh, he wanted them buried but he wanted them buried you know um so they would be taken up again so the families could be you know repatriated with their with their uh with their lad um and it was the first war from what i understand from mal simpson rsm2 para during the falklands it was the first time in british hist military history that the troops were actually repatriated if the families wanted them and mal simpson was part of that repatriation so the reason why you saw that picture there of the of the lads being put in the grave and it was a watery grave it really was i mean it was um you know um so they could be, you know, let's be frank about this, dug up um, and then repatriated. Yeah, it's almost like putting them in the freezer for a bit, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. You got it. Yeah, you know. yeah. Were, were you yeah. stood in this picture or did you have to do no, this I, sort of thing? I, I, no, I wasn't. No, that was done at Stanley because those bodies, remember, they had to be, they were kept at Ajax Bay um, outside, as I understand it. Uh, which was Rick Jolly, Commander Rick Jolly, who was in charge of that, the surgeon. Yeah, he, uh, God he, bless him, he passed he, away a couple he, of years ago. Yeah, he died fairly recently, didn't he? Yes, he did, yeah. Yeah, uh, very sad. Um, but they were kept at Ajax Bay. And then I interviewed a guy. In actual fact, he flew helicopters. Um, and I, I met him in Iraq. And we were on a job in Iraq. And uh, we kept in touch. And I sort of, when I was researching this book, I didn't know Steve was, had been in the Falklands. And he actually said that, um, yeah, he arrived on the second wave. And uh, he was with a squadron of uh, scouts. And he was given the job of picking up the cross that the local uh, carpenter had made down at uh, San Carlos Bay. The cross for the, the, that you will see once that's all being sort of filled in. And he flew that over. And as he was flying over Falkland Sound, they got attacked by, um, well, they didn't get attacked. There was two superintendents that flew over. And they, they got this massive cross stuck out the side of a scout. You know, he could hardly control the aircraft. And it, is, it was about nine foot long, this thing. But they managed to get it. You know, they managed to get it. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, quite poignant, really. No, I was over in Stanley when that picture was taken. Uh, they had one guy from each, uh, I, it, well, for C Company, there was three of us that went. I mean, I didn't go, but for each company, I think for there was uh, two or three guys from each company. One, um, I just want to clear something up. Lee, Lee in the chat is asking, hello, Lee. Thanks for joining us, mate. Um, he's saying, didn't Denzel lose a leg? And I think that was another Denzel. Was was that not three parallel Mount Longdon? Yeah, that's uh, Denzel, my old mate, Denzel Connick. No, Lee, this is the chap. Uh, he's called Denzel. Unusual name, I know. Um, Denzel, he's a Falkland Islander. Yeah, I know Denzel Connick very well. He's a good old buddy of mine. Have you ever um, heard of Jeffro, the Cornish comedian? 
Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. His um, his best buddy is called Denzel. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and uh, Jeff Ruth says, Denzel fell down a well. I mm. said, Denzel, have you broken anything? He said, there's fuck all down here to break. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. I've actually interviewed Denzel Connick for for, for a Goose Screen Uncensored, Uncensored Voices too, purely because of his three power. I wanted his story about when he heard about the victory at Goose Screen, because I mean they, along with the Marines, had that horrendous tab. I mean they tab from from Blue Beach wherever they. I think they were at Blue Beach, Green Beach, weren't they? They tab right across. I mean, amazing. We were quite lucky, really. We 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 got helicoptered halfway after the Battle of Goose Screen. Yeah, so. I'm look. I'm looking at at a shot now, Spud, of the aftermath of the battle, with all all the the, the gorses on fire, or the heather, whatever mm. it is. Um, yeah, it's gorse. There, there's equipment everywhere. Um, there's there's pop marks all all over the ground from I'm guessing armaments. Mm. What, what what is that feeling? What's it like to stand um, in amongst that? Um, I, I, as I mentioned on the last uh, podcast we did, it was when I moved forward through to A Company's position and I saw the initial carnage on Darwin Hill, which was the position where Colonel Jones got killed. And, uh, yeah, the White Foss had set that gorse on fire. I mean, that's White Foss for grenades for people out there. Um, that just basically had fuse instantaneous, and they set the, they set the gorse on fire. Uh, we had it as we advanced down into Goose Green too, um, but because they were throwing more shit at us than what we had to throw at them. I mean, most of those holes are Argentinians. I mean, they just we've well, seen the amount of ammunition they had on those pictures you just put up earlier. Yeah, that was a D Company position. D Company were, as I said, were over to my right. Okay. And they had just taken out a position there. Um, they were then, if, if you're looking at that photo right now, the airfield is ahead of them. I mean, behind them. This chap's looking at front of us, but it's behind him. He's, and that's the, air, the, the, they were heading towards the airfield. And they'd just taken a trench position there. What, um, what's the smell like? Is that a stupid question? What I mean, are you, um, are no, you, are it's, you smelling the, like... The cordite? smell is... Hmm, cordite. The smell is like the, the morning after a bonfire night. Um, that's what it smells like. Uh, so, quite sort of strong, pungent smell. But then, of course, you've got the burnt bodies there as well. You've got all the mucus and the, you've got the expended shell dressings that people have been trying to patch the casualties up. Um, you've got all the detritus of war, broken guns, helmets, um, people moaning, men moaning, crying, um, and the war's still going on. So you just got to go through that. Um, and of course, it, it's constant. Two para were under, were under the cost for 14 hours. I mean, it was, it was quite a horrendous battle. They say it was the, the biggest, bloodiest battle the British Army's fault of modern times. Mm. You know, we had, there was a battalion of about, I think battalion strength was about 600, but I think by the time we got there, with all the outs and debts that were all detached all over the place, we were probably down to about 400. Now, somebody may correct me, but within that 400, you had an element of stretcher bearers, medics, you know, mortars, machine guns, so the actual guys that did the advance down there, I guess, would no no more than uh, 250, but maybe 300, um, because that would be B Company, D Company, and C Company being half a company, um, and we just we just went hell for leather down there. I look did, back at it now and think, Christ, <laughs> you've got. But to, that was my um, war. Sorry to interrupt you on a on a yeah. parallel. Um, parallel topic but you've got somebody to say hello to in our chat and her name is jess and she says uncle nigel you absolute legend so proud of you uh -huh. oh thank you jess see me later <laughs> <laughs> thank, 
Thank you, Jess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, recognition mm. where recognition is due. That's all mm. I say. What, well, what... it was, it, you know, there was loads of us down. It was a battalion. Plus, there were there were a few Marines there as well. I'll give the Marines their due. Um, and we had some 2-9 uh, artillery boys there. It just wasn't all too para, you know. To, uh, also, you can't win a war on your own. It's, uh, it's a big army. And uh, it was all hands on for that one. Yes, I bet. Is it? Um, I've heard stories from my my marine friends that when you're on that start up line and you start mark well patrolling towards mm. the enemy. Um, my friend, I'm going to call him H. He just said, "Chris, all this." Like safety catch, change your lever, check your magazine, fit it. Mm. He, he said all of that just goes out the mm. fucking window. He's, uh, he, he's, mm. um, yeah. He's, he... It's yeah, it, it, because it's done. It's done mentally. You've done it already. You've done it physically, and you've done it in your head. What does go out the window is smoking. People that haven't smoked will start smoking. And the funny thing is, down there, is that because it was so bloody cold, it was absolutely freezing. I mean, although the sun does shine, it, it gusts 40 knot winds down there and it's the chill factor's horrendous. And you, what we used to get was the smokers got 20 Benson hedges a day and the non-smokers got a Mars bar. Now, you know, a Mars bar in those conditions just freezes. And those that didn't smoke started to smoke purely to put cigarettes in their hands, in their, in their mittens, just to keep their hands warm. Um, so, yeah. Um, I've just, there's one picture here, Nigel, of, I don't know what the guy's trying to do, but <laughs> he looks like he's trying to find one round in amongst absolute thousands. Can you see it? Mm. I think that's, um, that's the behind slope of Darwin Hill. I think I've never seen that picture, but I'm just going by, uh, the light and, um, because Forward of that is just it's just an open area into Goose Green, and that's what we went down. I think this is A Company when they reorged. Got you. Um, yeah, uh, that's after Jones got killed. Uh, probably immediately after. I'm I'm pretty sure that he's looking at the high ground on the left. Yeah. And um, Nigel, sorry, uh, I'm yeah. not. I'm not. I should warn you. I'm not very good at multitasking, so I've I've got two. <laughs> Three three yeah. computer screens going on here, so uh, right. bear with me if I'm a bit left of field. Mm. No problem. But one question's come in, and I, I heard somebody explain this the other day, and this is Gaz. Hello, Gaz. He's, he's asking about these rumours that there were US mercenaries in the Falklands. Um, mm. What... Yeah. what what I heard it explained that, that there may well have been Americans in the Falklands because some of the Argent, Argentines may have emigrated to America, got their citizenship. Then when the, um, this all kicked off, they then went, went and signed up or they wanted to fight for, for Argentina. Mm. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, you're right. A lot of them would have the American accent speaking English because they went off to do education over there. But uh, during the research of, of my book, um, and I won't say too much, I've, 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 come, I've had it collaborated through several guys that were there, that there were non-American mercenaries there. Mm. Um, that's all I want to say on that at the moment. But yeah. It shocked me. I never, I never experienced it at Goose Green, at Wireless Ridge, and certainly amongst the prisoners, the prisoner handling handling in Stanley. Certainly at Goose Green, from two very good sources, very respectable soldiers. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a bit of a, you know, a hot potato, <laughs> hot potato. That topic. Yeah. So, yeah. did you, did you guys wear your berries when you? When you fought the battle, no. The only um, 
the only unit to wear the berries was uh, from C Company, which were the patrols, because they were out. Uh, the, the, they got tasked to do something where they had to leave their Bergens. And um, for some reason, their helmets didn't go with them. I mean, my helmet stayed on my head. You know, I think it's alley to wear a berry, certainly in goose green, but uh, not not really right. You know, you get a headshot. It's just, just a fucking stupid thing to do, if you ask me. So, yeah, there was a there was a few guys that wore berries from patrol company to para. I think um, for, I think for a lot of the Marines, it was it was the fact that they had to yomp loads before they put their attacks mm. in. And it was just mm. out of necessity. They had to bin everything that was heavy in. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Now, on that, I can see that. Yeah, I can see the reason for that, yeah. Mm. Oh. My, again, my buddy H said when they left the start line to go up, I don't know if it was Mount Kent or Mount Harriet, but he said all all along the start line was a was just a row of helmets where everyone had just ditched their helmet. and, and Oh, and, really? Yeah, put their green wow. green berry on. Uh, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, People yeah, it's that, like a para thing as well, isn't it? With the maroon beret, the green beret. Uh, no, I, I adopted the safety approach, more safety approach. And, um, you know, there was a lot of shit flying around there. And, um, you know. <laughs> a lot of people um, picked up Argentine weapons, didn't they? Because they were superior. Is, is that yeah, I did. I picked up an FN. Um, yeah, folding stock FN. Um because the the SLR had uh, uh, it was just quite cumbersome, especially with the bayonet on the end. He had to ditch the bayonet eventually. But um, the funny, the fun, I've got a couple of funny stories about uh, <laughs> you know weapons in the Falklands. When we well, when the schoolhouse burnt down in Goose Green, um, because one of the guys had run out of M79 ammunition. He just dropped the gun. Well, I mean, like, like you said before, you've got to carry these frigging things. It's, it's no point in carrying something if it's not going to be any good to you. Um, so he dropped it when, when they were doing sort of CQB in the schoolhouse. And uh, when all the fighting died down a couple of days later in Goose Green, when, when obviously the color sergeants go around and start taking all the ammunition in Dent and find out who's Diffy this, who's Diffy that. Well, this chap, who name I will not mention, um, was Diffy his M79. So he had to go and look for it. He was he was ordered to go and look for it. And he found it and he came back to the colour man with this, you know, this burnt piece of metal. So at least they could sort of write it off, you know. Um, and of course, the other, the other thing about ammunition is that um, uh, at Fitzroy, two para were testing their weapons um, when the Galhad and Tristram were in, in Bay. And uh, all the rifle companies had gone on top of this hill to test fire in a makeshift range. And uh, then C Company, my company, which was half a company strength, patrols and recce, we then went up and tested, tested ours. And um, as we'd finished testing, we had to go and pick up all the empty brass like you do on the ranges. I mean, absolutely crazy. There's poles of it. So we're, I'm air sentry, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so why are they picking up, why the guys are picking up these empty cases, putting them in the sandbags? Four Skyhawks come out of nowhere and obviously drop bombs on the Tristan and Galahad. And we all know what happened to the poor old Galahad and Tristan. And uh, the Marines had a snowcat up there. And they, we were piling in the ammunition, these empty cases in the, in the sandbags in the back of this snowcat. Then all of a sudden, it was like, right, get the ammunition, get all those empty cases out the back of the snowcat. And we took the snowcat down to the beach to pick up the wounded. Um, years and years later, when I did my return trip, I found that pile of empty cases. The sandbag had, had, had been blown, but the pile of empty cases was still there. It was a huge pile. And they'd all, gone, they'd all been bleached brown. So wow. that was quite, you know. What? <laughs> What what was it like for you go, going back then? And what what year did you go back? I went back. I went back in uh, uh, another coincidence. I went back with uh, um, uh, Julian Thompson, brigadier at the time, to do a and with Max Hastings to do a uh, a, 
a documentary, Max Hastings goes back to wars. And I was just, I was sort of the grunt there just to give a sort of Tom's view, you know, and um, that was, well, we flew back. We flew back out of Stanley into Bryce Norton. And as we were flying the general Julian at the time, uh, the brigadier is general now um, was called forward to the cockpit of this RAF TriStar or whatever it was we were flying in. He came back and said to me, Spud, don't tell anyone else. Don't tell anyone else, Spud. But there seems to be an incident in New York, which was 9-11. And don't be surprised. When we land, we'll have jet fighters around us. And we had jet fighters as an escort into Bryce Norton. And I said to him, bloody hell, General. I said, the fucking scary thing about this is we'll have the RAF running around with bloody ammunition and weapons. <laughs> so that was that. Yeah. Blind. But going, but going, sorry, going back to that pile of ammunition at uh, Fitzroy with the Tristan and the Galahad. I'm not really knocking the officer, but yes, I am. Yeah, I am. Um, he he he'd, he'd switched off, and he was back in order shot mode on the ranges. You know, right? Pick up the empty brass. I mean, we're at fucking war. I mean, there's bombs being dropped. Okay, it was a quiet period, but I mean, the ships were still being bombed. People were still being killed. You know, ordnance was being expended. Uh, and there we were in the middle of this, on the middle of this hill, picking up these empty brass. And we'd just done Goose Green, and we we're going to go off and do Wireless Ridge. It just seemed so inane. Um, because the officer lad at the time probably couldn't get his head out of, you know, the training mode. Probably a safety valve or something. I'm not sure. Got you. Things you learn in life, isn't it, as you go on? Yes. It was a standing joke in the Marines that when we used to have to pick up the brass on the range, the Falklands veteran would go, you should have seen how it was after the Falklands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we always just thought that it was all it was all left. But yes. yeah, um, I don't know. Spud, what, I'm just conscious that we've had some very fine questions sent to us. OK, um, we should cover oh, there's them. me. There's a picture of me there. Did you see me there? I've got that you, picture. Yeah, I've got you up with all your. Um... That's at, that that that's at Fitzroy. That's at Fitzroy. That oh. was a day or so after the, uh, the the um the ships got bombed. Okay. Uh, hmm. Um. That's now now Al Nazaria. That was the day after we got uh, attacked by Fedayeen in in uh, Baghdad, uh, Iraq. Sorry. Is that the one with uh, the, chop the chopper in the background? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, 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 that's Al Nazaria, which was the biggest biggest battle in the Gulf War Two, the Iraq War. I just wow. happened to be there with the Royal Marine uh, with the uh, U.S. Marines. Yeah, sorry, we've got a bit of a de there's always a bit of a delay with the with the YouTube mm. stuff, so it's 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 a bit annoying that you're probably looking at photos that I've I've go <laughs> I've gone past. Um, right, well, I'm looking at three guys, me in the red, in the middle. Yep, okay, we're going to get back to this one. No, that, I don't, that, if that, you was a, that was upon your return, wasn't it? That was on the uh, film recce trip, uh, 2017, when oh, we wow. went down to do a recce for the film Goose Green. Um, that's myself in the middle. To the left is Stu Cardi, two paravet, and to the right is General... General Chip Chapman, who was uh, a young officer, uh, for uh, Six Platoon B Company, done really well. Wow. Done really well as a really young officer, and now he's a gen retired general. Cracking, cracking guy. Both two really great guys. Yes. So, Spuds, sorry, I'm just going to go to the mm. que uh, questions. Yeah. One second. Cracking. Let me just move my screen around a bit. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Um, so just w w I'd whip through these quite quickly, mate. Otherwise, yeah. we, we, could okay. be, we could be yeah, here yeah. all night. But we've got <laughs> a Alfie is asking, what was the killing, ho killing house like? What was it like? Yeah, the killing house. Noisy when I was in there. Noisy, very noisy when I was in there. Where your ample vox, your ear, your ear defenders. Yeah, um, yeah. 
it's basic basically a sorry go on no or i was going to ask the um the time honored question is it really your your instructor sits in sits in the chair when when you burst through the doors or windows yeah i've had yeah yeah absolutely it is i had the queen and uh, the duke of edinburgh there um, in in one part of the killing house there's a there's a mock theater and um i had to i had to ask the queen and the duke to move their heads because when the lights go down basically the idea is it's all silent and you just take the targets out in front. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, there are, there are, you know, there are like, <laughs> there are living people in there. Yeah. I mean, you, are you the level of, the level of skill, honestly, the level of skill is unbelievable. I mean, I didn't think it, I didn't think I could ever get to that level, but you do, you do that by firing 509 mil a day for a month. You know, you, you don't do that as a, in the, in the in the army, I doubt if you do it in the Royal Marines, not nine millimeter. Um, but you do that through constant practice. Mm. Just becomes second nature, then. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, it does. It everything's everything, everything moves. You know, the weapon becomes an extension of your body, and um, and that's what it is. It becomes natural. It becomes so natural. I look back at it now and go, "Wow, that's just that's really fucked up." You know how natural it becomes. Um, yeah. Uh, Bish was is asking. Um, I guess we're talking during your your time, Spud. Were there any Gurkhas in when you served? Not in the parachute regiment, no. In, in the um, um, but, in in the SAS. No, no Fijians. Naturally, no, not 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 Gurkhas. The Gurkhas took over from us in Goose Green. As a unit, um, yeah, there was a Gurkha officer, but no Gurkhas. They they missed out on, I don't know if missed out's the right word, probably a bit juvenile, but they, they did miss out on the sort of battles down there, didn't they, from what I understand? Yeah, because their, um, their target their, uh, was, was a feature just outside Stanley, and I think they knocked that on the head purely because the surrender was imminent i mean two para got in got into stanley first we took the unofficial surrender and then we were fucked off by the hierarchy which really pissed the guys off you know i mean i i went into stanley i was what <laughs> sounds awful doesn't it but i mean somebody's got to be there i was with the first group that went in and we had argies surrendering to us as we were going on the in the road to stanley and we had um, we were told by um I don't know who it was. May could have been could have been uh, Julian uh, Julian Thompson, Brigadier Thompson at the time, General now. S you know, to halt. We were told to halt, halt two power. We just said no bollocks. We're going in, and we did. Um, we had a uh, chopper crew, a Huey chopper crew, try to surrender to us, but we just told them to put their hands up and turn the machine off because, as kids, I mean, we were really we wanted to be the first in. Didn't even think about the threat getting sniped. Getting making it could have been a come on or something like that. You know, we were just like a bunch of kids sort of quick quick marching into on the road to Stanley. Yeah, I, I guess taking Stanley was 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 like marching into Berlin, wasn't it, in the Second yeah. World War. It was the the the, the symbol that, that that you'd won. Yeah. We we got to uh we got to the governor's house um where the uh, war memorial obelisk is and um we were told in no certain terms not to go any any f further forward. I mean, by that time, there was argies all over the place. They could have outnumbered us, taken us out, not a problem. So, you know, we sort of, we thought that the best thing was to do was to, you know, obey the order. Spud, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, um, question from Stuart to me, do I know Roland Hill? No, no, Stuart, I don't. Um, did you have a pager, Spud, when you served in the SES, or is that just for the quick reaction team? Yeah, that's for the the pager was for the uh, um, the counter terrorist team. Yeah. Did you? And I think they've only recently done away with them in the last few years. I don't. You know. 
Did, uh, does, yeah, you had a pager. Does everybody have to serve on that team, or is how does that work? Um, it's it's uh, it's rotation by squadron. Yeah, you have to do it. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, there's, that, a, there's a there's a sorry. You you wouldn't want to miss it though, would you? <laughs> No, you want to get in the black kit. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty good stuff, really. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to be on two operations. And, uh, yeah, it's a different type of soldiering. Um, we call it the black kit because it's basically black as opposed to the green kit, uh, which is the camouflage. Yeah, it's a different skill. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's very, very political, though, in the sense that whatever, whatever the SAS or the SB do, you know, they come under the sort of umbrella of, you know, governments will, will fall if the guys screw up. I mean, it's that sort of, that, that close. Um, yeah, the pressure's so, on. Yeah. I mean, it's, I just, I'm just so impressed with the guys, um, how they are today, um, the skill factor. They have to take a lot more in than, than my time, a lot more technical, a lot more technical stuff to be getting on with more political shit as well, you know, mm. and the lads and the girls, they have to take a lot more in than my day. My day was just Hollywood. Go out, you know, get through that window, pop off a few caps, get downtown, you know, get downtown Hereford for a few beers after. It's quite basic. I think there's a bit more to it than, than that these days. They have to go debrief, debrief, then they have to go to compression and make sure you're not going to go and blow some fucker's head off downtown, you know. And it's all, it's a bit of all sort of backslapping and stuff as well, I think, you know. Spud, can you see the picture that's up at the moment? It's you and your, yep. your skydiving gear. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've uh, just, halo kit, yeah. yeah. You know, I've, I've just got to go and pay the piper. So could you tell our friends at home what, what's going on in this picture and, and how how do you prepare yourself for something like this? And, yeah, yeah. What, what happens, basically. I'll, I'll be back in a second, folks. All right. Yeah, that was uh, that was that was me uh, in Halo Kit, high altitude, low opening parachute. Um, I'm in a hook. It's definitely a hook by the looks of it. Um, um, would have been going up to about twenty five thousand feet. I don't have a helmet, and you don't see my oxygen. My oxygen's not not on there. I can't see. Yes, it is. Yeah, the oxygen is just below the altimeter. Um, and we were probably going up to about 25,000 feet, which is about five miles high. Um, I'm pretty sure that isn't a night jump because I've, I think I've got a bit of a smile on my face. So uh, um, night jumps tend to knock the smile off your face, <laughs> being more dangerous, of course. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what that is. You go at the back of the hook. That's the way you exit the aircraft. Um, it takes you about 120 minutes to reach terminal velocity, which is 100 odd miles an hour. And um, you'll jump out, make up a patrol of four, five, even six. You may follow a bundle. A bundle is a, a, a bundle is a large container on a drogue chute that carries all your kit, and you can follow that down, and you can uh, you can you can go with it. And um, yeah, uh, you, you come down to about three and a half thousand feet, and your automatic uh, uh, pull happens and um hopefully the chute opens three and a half thousand feet is very high actually when i used to sport parachute I used to take it down to about 1500 well, some blokes used to snake it right down to about nine but that was stupid but yeah that's what it is it's a halo high altitude low opening as opposed to hey ho high altitude high opening yeah i when i did my skydiving course in florida spud there was a the, the ground technician for the skydiving center, so basically the gardener, that the handyman, mm. he used to jump out at. We used to we used to go up between twelve and fifteen thousand feet. Technically, at fifteen, I think you're supposed to use oxygen, but sometimes we yeah we yeah. just we just did it. Um, but he he would jump out at these heights and pop a shoot immediately. And then as he floated wow. down to earth, which must take, I don't know, you, you probably know better than me, but... 15 minutes? Yeah, maybe. quite quite yeah. some time. He had a... Ten. He had a... Well, at least a, 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, he had like a Tupperware 
pot thing on his harness full of <laughs> full of tequila <laughs> oh. tequila and lemonade or something and he just breaking all, oh, all, all all the safety rules um but yeah that's that's what the guy did yeah yes yeah, yeah well it's a bit cold up there with a halo hop and pop it's bit, even at fifteen thousand, you um, i mean it's absolutely freezing so you, you you'd want to be wearing the right kit wouldn't you because at twenty five thousand, you, you, your goggles freeze up, so you're falling down and you're having to scrape your goggles because of the ice. You know, and you've got this bloody big container on the back of you, strapped around your legs. It must, a huge parachute. Yeah, it must just add um, a whole another nightmare of 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 kit. If you're jumping out mm. of that height where you can literally freeze if you've not got the right undersuit on or thermals or whatever whatever, yeah. whatever the case may be and of course the uh the air is very thin up there so you, you you're even more unstable that's why helicopters have trouble when they're up at height they can't get the lift and of course if you go out and the slipstream knocks your container a bit off the back of your legs you know it puts you in a, can put you into a bit of a spin it's happened to me a few times you know it, it takes a good few thousand feet to actually find out which way you're spinning and to slow yourself down and try and sort of uh, get yourself back on track. Um, you know, a fact for the op the automatic opening device, I mean, it's a dodgy old business. Yeah, it, 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 it sounds like a barrel of nightmares, to be honest. Sport um, parachuting is fine. You could do it all day long. It's just fun. Whereas this is dangerous. Dangerous yes. shit. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredibly dangerous. I... I I'm not even going to ask you how many people must have uh, must have been killed mm. doing it. But yeah. I'm just going to go through. I made some notes from our yeah, pod yeah. podcast. Um, we've got a chap called Mike Carter who said he was in um, bum bum bum. I think he's saying Steve Pryor's section. Um, oh yes, yes, Steve, good guy. Yeah, apparently Steve caught it up apparently that's for our friends yeah, uh, at home that's a euphemism for for getting uh, getting dead yeah steve um very good friend of mine full screw in in a company he was killed on uh, darwin hill um all oh, right and who was that that that's as a chap called michael what? carter mike carter he hello was, mike he was i in... don't know you buddy but, yeah um must have been a company yeah, he was in a company, Steve's Steve Price section. Oh, was he? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you'd like to share his story with me, I mean, you can get me, on, just get onto my website, nigelealy.com, and link me with the email, and then uh, we can take it from there. I'd yeah. love to hear from him. There you go, Mike. Yeah. Or, or just get hold of me, mate, and I'll, I'll, I'll put you in touch. Um, we've got to ask you about the Danny Dyer was it Danny Dyer's hardest men? Were you? All uh... oh, right, Danny Dyer hardest men, mate. Yeah. <laughs> which... I was. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Go. Go. Go for it. Which Which episode was, or or, or what What happened I... in it? Well, I was on the. I was in the first one, and uh, I didn't want to do it because they had. They called it Danny Dyer's hardest man or something, and I said no. I don't want to be anything to do with that with drug dealers and bouncers and all that nonsense, but I was persuaded. Uh, the money seemed all right. So I was persuaded to do it. I didn't have any edit editorial control, but I was ass assured that um, I'd have a lot of input into it and I wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't make me out to be a complete tosser. Um, so, and it was, it was really received well. I mean, it was shot in my friend's place, Aaron Bauer, who's, um, who does a lot for the, uh, I did a lot of business with him in Kuwait. He's sort of like an arms dealer. He's got this big old spread over in Lincolnshire, 12th century big manor house. So it was great settings. He had all the weapons and he had the flashbangs. And basically the, my episode was about what I did. And uh, the very first thing I set Danny up, what the program was about, Danny would drive in without even meeting the person he's going to sort of interview. And that was part of the, the, the series. So we'd never met before. So the idea was he drove in up this long, windy drive. I'd already set up an ambush. He would come and greet me. 
I would shake hands. He would get out the car, shake hands, and then obviously there would I, I had instigated an attack to kidnap him. And then I saved him. You know, the flashbangs went off and guns were fired. And that's how it was. And it was it was it was all right. It was very well received, apparently. I I feel I don't feel uncomfortable doing things like that. Um I you know, it's not like I crave all the uh the ratings and everything else. Um but yeah, I'm I'm pleased I did it eventually. But I don't think I'd ever do that sort of thing again. It's a bit too corny. Yeah, I found it a disappointment because my money was on Danny for being a hard man, mm. <laughs> being a bit tasty, yeah. bit tasty. And then when there was that episode where he had to go and sleep out for the night. <laughs> and he oh, yeah, you bottled it, didn't he? He completely yeah. bottled it. And it was like, oh, Dan, come on, man. Um, yeah, I don't know if people, if our friends at home know what know what we're uh, what we're talking about. But um, <laughs> he got he got that's actors. That's that. actors for you. He's, he's, he's obviously got talent. He's still a, he's still in the job and he's got talent and he's a cheeky chappy and, you know, good luck to him. But uh, they, when they play the hard men, they're not really hard, you know. They're, they're actors. They're yeah, actors. of course. I think um, yeah. one thing you realise from these reality TV shows and the, the Jungle series and all that sort of stuff is, God, they're bloody soft and spoiled, aren't they, a lot of them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's. Yeah, I've just. Um, but apparently, it makes it makes good viewing. Apparently, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just want to say hello to Chris Dangerfield, who's popped up in our chat. Wonderful man, fantastic um, YouTube channel, and uh, I call Chris a fellow justice warrior. Oh yeah. Um, a, a, a real man, aren't you, Chris? We're we're real men, and we're not we're not we're not afraid of <laughs> we're not ashamed. A great surname, yeah. great surname. It's Love brilliant. It. Yeah, Chris is a, a stand-up comedian. So, all right, yeah, yeah. Um, in the yeah, the, this is this picture here is over the cart Blake Aaron's cart Blake. That's ah okay. Me and, me and Danny Dyer. Yeah, you are looking seriously hard there, Spud. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? You look like you're uh, you're turning into stone with your your graniteness. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm quite a nice geezer, really. You know, I mean, I, just, I can't be blessed with these good looks, can I? I mean, they're not uh, can't do anything about them, really. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, you and me both, mate. You and me. It, it's a <laughs> it's a curse. Yeah. yeah. I have women yeah. women trying to beat my door down, and um, that's. Oh. That's just trying to escape. Yes. Well. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just trying to focus on the question. So, dun, 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 dun. did you know Abe Lincoln? Mark is asking you that. Yeah, I know Abe, yeah. There you go. Why, do, why do you ask, Mark? Uh, Mark, another interesting podcast, Chris. Our section commander in Browning Barracks was former Pathfinder who later went on to pass selection could you ask spud if he knows abe lincoln he may do he was a constant yeah i do yeah i know him very well i served with abe he was in recce with me down in the falklands oh, and he came up to h yeah i know him very well small world isn't it yeah 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 <laughs> we've got a chap here who was the he's calling himself the token eod uh mines advisor I think he was attached to Olive Group at one time. Right. Um, in Basra Airport, two thousand and three. He seems to think he. he yeah. He knows you. Um, he's. I not, was there. He's he's not left his name. It only his. Um, um. Anyway. Yeah. Truffles are us. If you're watching, he's he's calling you a legend and. Uh, oh. Um. He's a, <laughs> he's a master of understatement. This man. Um, dum bum bum. I've got not still dead here. I, I think this is for me. How do Royal Marines get woken up? Is it someone yelling or a trump <laughs> trumpet? Um, put it this way: if someone yelled at you, they'd get the. You'd rush yeah. out and get that trumpet and shove it up their ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
no we don't have any of that stuff even in train yeah. even in training you just set an alarm and you get yourself up the train team aren't going to get up at that time to mm. to come and check, T check Chris, on you. T tell me is it when you're on parade as a royal marine is it true the inspecting officer has to tell you he's going to touch you before because there was some instant go back in your history that uh, some officer didn't say excuse me i'm just about to touch you and this guy hit this marine hit the officer i don't know how true that is dave slater told me that years ago it, it's it's quite possible um <laughs> there are all kinds of um idiosyncratic rules in the navy um mm. for example boot necks we salute like this whereas a matlow sailor salutes like this and apparently the the history behind that is the marines are, are well known for their hygiene so they'd always wash their hands whereas the sailors would have dirty hands yeah. from you know cleaning up fixing up the ship so there's things like that so you yeah you salute like a uh, army like the army longest way up shortest way down yeah it's longest way up yeah and then straight shortest down, way down. Straight, yeah that's straight, it yeah straight yeah straight down. Or you can do what my mate did when he was going up the gangway on H when we we're on HMS Invincible and the captain came down the gangway and Nigel was carrying his kit bag, his seaman's kit bag on his right shoulder, so he couldn't let go of it and the captain came down so he went <laughs> he saluted, <laughs> saluted with the other yeah. other arm. I think that, that yeah. got a few people smiling. Crazy. Um, I've no noticed a couple of people, Spud, asking, did you work in, they're calling it Spitalfields Market? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, that was the first job I had when I, um, someone sent me a, I don't know whether it was an email or something on Facebook, and I, I tried to find it, uh, but I, I get so much, it's probably got lost in the sort of, you know, it got lost. But yeah, I did, yeah, I, um, I worked up there for about several months as a kid, yeah. Wow. Lovely place. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Full of proper people up there. Proper people. That was Gavin. So thank you, Gavin. Um, okay. okay, folks, I'm going to end the questions there. Otherwise, we're just going to go on all night. So let me hide that one. Um, I'm just going to check the chat, Spud, to mm. see if anyone's asking us anything in the chat so massive yeah. thank you to everyone could you please give the video a like and and also subscribe to the channel if you'd be so kind um it's as i've said a couple of times now chats like this need to go down on the record um this is people fa mm. people's family this might mean the difference between a son who's never known his father because they were killed in the Falklands. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it might mean the difference between they hear something about their dad that they, that they, they never, sure. you know, otherwise they're never going to know. So if everyone could please um, like and support the channel, um, you'll be absolute legends. <laughs> um, okay, last thing I'm going to do Spud, and then you're you're out of here. Yep. You've got your you've got your freedom. <laughs> I've got my. I can catch the last half of uh, Sale and uh, Newcastle. The rugby. Oh, sorry about that. And friends, just That's all to, right, mate. Just to say, look what I've got. So we've got bought the t-shirt merchandise now. Have a look below the video. <laughs> um, what was I going to do? I was going to show you. You probably won't be able to see this, Spud, because it. The, the delays too much right um i was just going to show the balloon jump if we give it oh if, god yeah if we give it a yeah. few a few seconds you, tell me on your screen when you can see the the helium balloon yeah oh, unbelievable that's unbelievable can you can you i see don't know it? why they, it's a no not yet it's a cheap it's a cheap way of parachuting <laughs> i think it's gone now now they yeah, use, they don't do it. Yeah, now they use something called the sky van. Um, oh, the aircraft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the young paras and um, well, anyone, whether bootnecks or whatever, getting airborne these days, they miss out on this. Oh um, yeah, well the balloon really, the balloon really is the one. 
Yeah, oh, it was, in, it was incredible. And I, I was lucky enough to do... Oh, that's crazy. It's a, it's a crazy jump. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to do two power courses. So, or... Wow, um, yeah. Or one and a half, I should say. So I, I got to do the balloon twice, which was amazing. Um, can you see it yet, Spud? Not yet, no. I probably think it's quite a long delay, but... Uh... I'll let you know. I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah. yeah. No, no incredible, incredible to do the balloon jump. I mean, it, it's incredible, isn't it, to do it to have it oh, as your first jump as well. It's oh, it's a part of British military history. It's, I mean, it's it's yeah. just an incredible experience that I real feel sorry for people now that they they're not going to get that. Um, also, it's almost like doing a base jump, isn't it? It's it. It's almost yeah. like the military equivalent of a base jump because you're, yeah. you're jumping off a off a platform. Um, so uh, I mean, it's a, it's the equivalent of flying in a Spitfire, isn't it? Ah, oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, you could you, you, we could sort of do a little uh, have a little business like that with a couple of barrage balloons and cages. How many yes. times you could go up each? Uh, you could probably go up a, a dozen times a day. <laughs> I was really lucky, Spud. I. I I got to fly an actual Spitfire. Um, wow. I will say my caveat is it was on the ground. It was, uh, uh, what do they call them? The, the mock-ups, the si oh, sim right, simulator. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. actually built from an actual yeah. Spitfire. Um, chap wow. called R Richard. Hello, Richard, if you're watching, uh, who was a fan of the podcast, invited me up to... Mm. Uh, I can't even remember where where it was now. It was somewhere up country. So Chris, come and fly this Spitfire simulator. And as a as a pilot myself, it was so realistic. Oh, it was. Right. It oh, was you, yeah. It was unreal. Wow. Can you see? The... I've just got you putting up your your mug there. <laughs> Gosh. So we really that was are... after that was after the video, wasn't it? So after we before we started talking about balloons and cages. What was what what was after, mate? You putting the mug up? Yeah, I put that up ages oh. ago, didn't I? I? And then did you do the balloon? Because the balloon doesn't come up yet. Yeah, I've got the balloon up on the desktop now, so people can see. Oh, it. okay, it might come up. Yeah, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Yeah, we should. Yeah, I'm just. Gonna... We we should do. Sorry, Spud. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we should do. Um... We should do one about the book, writing a book as well. That might be quite good for your uh, subscribers. Well, let's um, let's do another you, live. Both you and I can do it, can we? Yeah, let's do another live, Spud, because um, otherwise we don't want to go on too long. Because people who are not watching it now will look. Oh, at oh yeah, no, I don't mean on this. But, I don't mean on this segment. No, but definitely, definitely, um, Gaz. I did two power courses, brother. Because on the first power course, yeah. all the it's up now, yeah. All the Hercules got sent out to the first Gulf conflict, so the paracourse was ended after the balloon jump. Um, you probably heard me say this in podcast, folks, but the two, the room I shared at Bry's for my first paracourse with, was with two SAS troopers, so two SAS guys. Really, really nice, um, nice chaps. I don't know if I'm allowed to say their name, so maybe I won't. Um, but you'd probably, I think you'd at least know one of them, yeah. Spud. Yeah. And, um, it was great. We were in the grot, which is the room as we, as us bootnecks call it. And they said, Chris, do you know a chap called Bob Consiglio? And mm. I said, I don't know him personally, but he's a sort of legend in the Marines because he was, we thought at the time he was the first guy to join the SAS instead of the SBS, right? Which, All right. which meant back then you actually had to leave the Navy, you leave the Marines, join the Army, and then actually, you know, so you, you, you risked your whole career basically by trying to join the SAS from the Marines, and, and Bob did it. Hmm. And, of course, he was in the, the ill-fated Bravo 20 patrol. And when I literally got home from that paracourse when it was cancelled... Um, I went back to my old man's place and I put his telly on and there mm. was a, a coffin coming out of a church draped, draped with a Union Jack and the news person says today the people of so-and-so buried the body of trooper Bob Consiglio right 
of the 22nd oh, oh, oh. SAS, the first wow. first casualty of the Gulf War. Um, so you can imagine my jaw bloody drops, bud, you know? Incredible. Um, wow. I, I went to see Bob last, uh, well, last November. He's down in St. Martin's. Went down to see him. He's down there with uh, the rest of the guys. Yeah. What in the in the is it the set the 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 regiment cemetery? Well, it's the civilian church called St Martin's down by the old camp. Uh, Bob and all the guys are down there, um, but at the new camp they've got another, they've got another cemetery. Yeah, like some, a chapel. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Just gonna... Yeah, I've got I've got a picture of the barrage balloon now. Yeah, okay. oh, unbelievable. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, sorry, folks. I've just gone to a picture of Bob. Let me just take that down a sec. Uh, sorry, I'm getting myself all 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 messed up, Spud. Somebody sent me a <laughs> sent me a real eye opening picture of Bob Consiglio the other day. Um, it was from the the Marines days. Oh, right. Hang on a second. We've frozen. Um. Sorry, for some reason I, I froze there. Um, bear with us, folks. We're we're freezing up a bit here. Let's go back to the desktop. I was going to play you that clip, wasn't I? If I can find it. Yes. So, Spud, I'm just going to play this. Um, cool. Bugger me, chaps. Bloody high here, isn't it? Right, oh okay, into the door. Don't panic, mummy loves got the you. Barrage balloon. Right, I've got don't you look on the down. Right live. I said, don't look down. I'm... Right, don't worry about it. Put mate. your arms across your bloody reserve. That's it, soldier. What is HelloFresh? Oh, <laughs> and YouTube gave us, YouTube Hello gave Fresh. us adverts. Hang on a second. I go online. Right Hello in the middle Hello of the balloon Fresh. jump, YouTube put us on adverts. Wait, wait. <laughs> wow. Yeah, sorry, Spud. I was just um, That's all right. I was just playing our friends at home uh, a clip of the balloon jump that I took. I've done a couple of podcasts on the paracourse because for mm. me it was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It certainly was one of the probably the best course in the military. Um, and so yeah, I've done a couple of podcasts about it, and uh, wow, that was the legendary for friends at home. That was the legendary balloon jump you just saw. Um, and it really, it really is just, just what it looks like. Oh. Oh. Uh, it is crazy. Spud, listen, you've been an absolute legend yet again. Let's, let's do this again another night, can we? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've got all this month to record my audio book, so, you know, it's not much fun for me so this is this is fun so um <laughs> just when you do your audio book you're listening to your voice for six hours a day it's crazy it must be it must be excruciating yeah yeah, yeah. yeah look arrange, we're arranging a date in the not too distant future and uh yeah we're gonna crack on definitely be great friends at home um don't forget to check out spud's books I put a link below in the description that will take you take you to Amazon where you can go and grab grab yourself a copy. Um, Spud, once again, mate, massive thank you. Um, this has just been well, great great fun for me and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Deep deep insight into into Goose Green as well. So, Spud, don't. Um, uh, in fact, let me do it this way. Friends at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe, leave a question for my next chat with Spud. Leave it below in the comments and um, we'll see you next time. Spud, don't don't um, stay on the line, brother. Just you log off now because I'm going to yeah. play play some outro stuff and I'll, I'll give you a bell okay, tomorrow. Chris. Okay, Chris. Brilliant. Take care, buddy. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, you know. Spud. Thank you now. Thank cheers, you, everyone. Cheers. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando. 
I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.